loves it, chills you, chills you to the bone. You ain't just whistling Dixie, brother. So I listened to the sucker on audiobook, and a young British man through whom I heard it casually mentioned up Dickens. Uh, it's not subtly done, you know, and it, but it works. And I could scarcely agree more. Citations, fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and I am here once again at Dickens Fest to more scenically use the androgynous sounds of my voice to share with you a few words about The Chimes, a Goblin Story, written by Charles Dickens in 1884. If you are unfamiliar with the story, it is one in which boy meets girl, girl likes boy pretty good, boy proposes to girl, and on New Year's Eve, girl makes a hot tripe dinner with which to butter father up while asking permission to marry. Father, the point of view character, is Toby, also known as Trotty, because his main hustle is carrying things to and fro for comparatively wealthy people. Toby is also a sprightly old man with a gentle soul, who finds comfort in the steadiness of the church bells as he makes his rounds below their domain. But more often than not, he finds himself heartsick from the internalized classism foisted on him by rich guys who legit wish the poor would die and free up resources for better non-poor people. And so, Trotty generally spends the waking hours of his day hunched over, carrying the baggage of the rich. Uh, it's not subtly done. Nevertheless, Trotty cheerfully greets his daughter Meg, and eats his yummy, yummy tripe while she tells him of her wedding plans for the New Year's Day. But before he can finish his meal, a wealthy customer known far and wide as Alderman Cute tells Meg's boyfriend Richard he is a fool for wanting to marry her. Furthermore, he tells Meg that if they do get married, he'll put all her kids in jail as often as he can. He implies Trotty is a filthy waster for daring to eat such an extravagant thing as tripe, then takes the tripe away and eats the rest of Trotty's meal in front of him. Right, so, quick aside. I think in our collective literary consciousness, a lot of us are kind of sort of aware of Oliver Twist's gruel in the broader sense that gruel is kind of nasty and this poor starving orphan feels compelled to ask for more. But we don't tend to talk about Trotty's tripe. That sounds quite contagious, doesn't it? And while I've never had tripe and cannot comment on his quality, I had a buddy once in nursing a million billion years ago who talked of tripe in her family as an endurance exercise and a hazing ritual for potential suitors. So, in the context of the story, what did it say about Trotty that he is glad to get this repulsive fish? That the rich guy, who is supposedly a friend of the poor, takes shots at Trotty for daring to eat it, then takes it away and eats it himself. We live in a society, says Dickens. It's not subtly done. Anyway, Alderman Cute pays Trotty a pittance to take a letter to a co-conspirator against the poor. As a result, Trotty finds himself in the unique position to save the asses of a convict with a heart of gold named Will Fern, and his orphaned niece, Lillian. But all the while, Trotty grieves, because the world appears to be made of sadness, and he has very much been encouraged to think he is part of the problem. After he gets the two refugees home and fed, the household goes to sleep, while Trotty reads tragedy after tragedy in the newspaper, kind of like doom-scrolling, but from side to side, not up and down. Then, in the dead of night, Trotty finds himself called to the church by ominous sounds in the bell tower. And as it happens, the bells from which he's taken so much comfort over the years are possessed by goblins who are terribly cross with him. You have done us wrong, Toby Vec. You have often given up hope and wished you were never born. After this exchange, these goblins take Trotty on an It's a Wonderful Life style journey, in which he sees what becomes of his dear ones in the coming years if he's not around. Uh, spoilers, says the goblin. Richard listens to Alderman Cute, marries someone who is not Meg, and becomes a hopeless drunk. Meg, for her part, literally works herself to death as a seamstress. Wilfern moseys in and out of jail, leaving Lillian to the wolves, and Lillian jumps off a bridge with her newborn in tow because she too sees no hope for the future. At which point, a troubled Trotty awakes to find it is New Year's Day. Everyone's okay for now, with the potential to be okay in the future. And Meg says to Trotty, And whatever you do, father, don't eat tripe again. No. It doesn't agree with you. So, there is more of Gravy than of Gravy about you. Neat. Very truly, this story hits me different than it would have a couple years ago. Because I got god kids who are just starting to see the world. Both as it is, and its potential for what it could be later. And if I, like Trotty, start acting like there is no hope of changing it, the odds of them living as if they can change it go down quite a bit. 
So when Dickens says of Scrooge that his dearest love should not be money, and says to Trotty that his dearest love should be hope, he's not wrong. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. I post whenever I can. Until we meet again, take it easy. Love you. Bye.